I'm going to share just a quick little anecdote that I shared with my section on the first day, but I'll share it with the other two groups as well. I was at, uh, I was at home, it was earlier this summer, because I was at home in the middle of the day, I was watching a sports uh, talk show on television, sports radio talk show, um, and the host was interviewing an author who was, rec- who was releasing a brand new book, and so he was talking about the book and the people in it, and one of the words that he used really caught my ear. He described the person that the book is about as being a Shakespearean character, living a Shakespearean life. Which I thought, wow, that's a, that's a pretty brave choice for a, for a journalist to use on a sports talk show. Because considering the host is a sports guy, the journalist himself is a sports guy, but also you would have to assume the millions of people across America that are listening are tuned in to hear about sports, not hear a word like Shakespearean. What's so interesting about that is in popular culture or even in our everyday conversation, we might hear a word like that that's based on a person or an idea or some text from the past. And if you don't know what those important texts or people or ideas are, you are left out of the conversation. He didn't, the journalist didn't take time to explain what he meant by Shakespeare, and he just assumed that the listener knew and I assume he did, I did, but I wondered about all those people across America tuning in that had no idea what the word Shakespearean might mean. The fact is that that's why we have these classes, that's why we talk about these texts that we think, oh, they're old, who cares about them anymore? We talk about these authors or these, these influential figures from the past. Well, it's because they built the foundation of who we are today, and they still are relevant. Even 500 years later, someone's still using a word like Shakespearean. So, if you're going to participate in the culture, you have to know what those foundational elements are, and that's what a class like this is, that's what texts like this do for us. They allow us to participate, and actually have conversations with each other, where we have common ground, we know what we're talking about. You don't have to sit and explain it. I can say Shakespearean and you know exactly what I might mean. So it's important that we grasp these cultural foundations, because it's who we are. If you don't know where you came from, you're going to be lost. So, the word Shakespearean is part of our dialect, or part of our, our vernacular, but so is the word Dickensian, actually. And if you don't know what Dickensian means, then maybe that's something you might need to look into. So, the way that Dickens himself and this book pop up in popular culture or in our everyday life are actually kind of amazing. They, 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 they pop up more than you might think. you remember the film from a couple years ago, The Dark Knight Rises? You might not know that Christopher Nolan built that film around the premise of A Tale of Two Cities. If you pay attention to the ending, the final speech that that, uh, uh, Commissioner Gordon gives about Bruce Wayne and, and his death, that's taken right from the text of Tale of Two Cities, the final passage is right from the text. Uh, We also, you know, the, the, the kangaroo courts that are in that film, the, the way that Bane acts is very much in line with someone like Madame Defarge. If you don't know that when you watch it, can you still get something out of that movie? Well, of course you can. It's still entertaining. But if you know where it comes from, if you know the foundations that made a, the themes of a film like that, it becomes that much more interesting. It provides many more layers for you to consider and to think that, oh, well, Christopher Nolan didn't just think of these things himself. He actually borrowed these ideas from something 170 years ago. So, this book is part of our culture, whether you even recognize it or not. I know you can't see that, but when I, when I post uh, this for you, you can look at these things yourself. If you just type into Google, a tale of two, and click on the news feed, because if you type it in a normal, it'll, of course, the book will pop up, but if you type it into the news feed, the phrase, a tale of two, will produce endless amounts of hits. Because anyone writing an article where you want to compare two things, the easy shortcut way of doing it is just say, a tale of two, et cetera. So the one up here was, uh, there's a tale of two like quarterbacks, a tale of two um, governors, a a tale of two anything. But if you don't know where the phrase a tale of two comes from, you're missing out on a part of the foundation of who we are as a culture. It's important to know where these things came from. Two weeks ago was the Ryder Cup, and I was watching, 
If you watch the first day, the Americans did very well in the morning, but then played terribly in the afternoon. So the next day when coverage started, the announcer, to kick off that day's coverage, actually said this quote, it's fitting that we're here in Paris, that's where the tournament was held, because yesterday for the Americans, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Again, I watched television thinking, wow, I can't believe it that the, that the announcer would make that cultural connection, running the risk that maybe millions of people watching around the world or watching uh, on television wouldn't know what the best of times and the worst of times means. But what it meant was, well, the Americans were really happy on, <laughs> in the morning on that day, and then the second half of the day they played terribly and it went horribly wrong for them. So, again, any time where there's a change in things going from you know, being very positive or going well to being very negative, um, the shortcut vernacular of best of times, worst of times, is something that if you know what this book is about, you can instantly understand what that person might mean. So understanding the shortcuts of culture, that's, what, that's why we have you read these texts. That's why we talk about these people. That's why we talk about these ideas, because this is where we came from, and they still exist today. And if you don't know what they mean, you get left out. And we don't want anybody to be left out of our cultural conversations. After all, how can you influence culture with truth if you don't know what our culture is made up of? So. A little something to think about from a cultural standpoint of why we do what we do in this class and where this book might take us. When thinking about what good literature is, <clears throat> we need a really, really brief historical context here. And luckily for you, if you remember from Hume 201 and 202, you might be able to be able to you might be able to see this already. For lack of a better phrase, I'm just going to really generalize so that we all understand what we're talking about. Up through the Renaissance, let's say, which is where you ended up in Hume 202, the idea of classical literature. All right, that's what tended to prevail from the ancient Greek times all the way up through the Renaissance. Again, I'm generalizing big time, but that, that'll give us a starting point. So the themes of those pieces of literature or those pieces of art tended to be aiming at whatever the highest good was, the highest beauty, the highest form of justice, the highest form of goodness, all those things, right? And the artistic productions that came out of those time periods not only aimed at those ideas in their content, but even how they're constructed. So if you remember when I came and talked about uh, John Donne, just really quickly about the, the way that poems were constructed, we see the, the attention to detail in, in those pieces of poems, so those, those couplets that have to have the perfect rhyme and rhythm, the sonnets that had the precise syllabic constructions, they had the precise rhyme schemes, because the construction of the piece of art itself was intended to be a model or the, the, the pursuit of perfection, okay? So classical literature tended, intended, I'm generalizing, tended to do, tended to have that as their main goal. But once we start reaching the Enlightenment era, once we start picking up what's happening in the midst of and then after these two revolutions we've been talking about, Art, and especially literature, start to change a bit. And instead of being the pursuit of whatever this abstract highest ideal is, and creating art and literature that is perfectly constructed, right, that very few people can do, only the best people can actually construct poems that way, let's say, becomes a little more free-flowing. And in this era, what we call the Romantic era, this typifies, generally, what good literature is. So what exactly is it? Well, in this turn in the 19th century, we have the noticeable reflection of these social movements that we've been talking about in this class, and that people are being influenced emotionally to respond to them. So, in our Sister Revolutions book, we get a Interesting quote from Robespierre, who we talked about the other day. He 
we get the sense of what emotion we're talking about. Revolutionaries impatiently dismissed reserve, understatement, and subtlety as signs of indifference to the revolution. Their world historical enterprise called for hyperbole and passion. If emotions were not histrionic, inflamed, excessive, volcanic, they were deemed insufficiently revolutionary. People were not permitted to have calm emotions about anything, observed Tocqueville. Words had to suppress the feelings one wanted to express. So the connection between the feelings I have and the words that I produce directly correlates with the literature of the time period. And so what we see from the other famous writers of the time period, like William Wordsworth, who said, poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. That's like the defining line of Romantic era literature. Spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, where I'm observing the world, and I've, I've been take, so taken by it, I'm so moved by it, that I have to write it down immediately and express myself to my full humanness. That's what poetry of the time, and eventually other forms of literature of the time, tried to do. Percy Shelley, another famous uh, poet of the time, said that literature of this age, that we're talking about now, has arisen as if it were from a new birth, that for the best writers, electric life burns less from their own spirit than the spirit of the age. So again, the movement of the Enlightenment and beyond is actually pushing these authors forward and their, their emotions are coming out into the text. William Hazlitt echoes that. He's a critic of the time, uh, wrote on a variety of literary and social topics. He said, new literature had its origin in the French Revolution. It was a time of promise, a renewal of the world, and of letters and literature. So, there's a distinct separation that starts, evolution, let's say, that starts to occur right around this time period. We're moving away from these carefully constructed, perfect representations of art and literature into, no, what the author feels, what the society around him is, is causing him to react to, that's what becomes good literature. And it shapes all of the 19th century. Now, Dickens comes around slightly later. He's classified as a Victorian author, not necessarily a romantic author, but we have to know that as a child and as a young person, he grew up in the romantic period. And so you can see it definitely affects how he writes and how he views the world. I also personally sort of extend the romantic era beyond what it is because I, I can see its influence all the way past the 1860s, let's say, even further than that. So I think the romantic era actually goes further and Dickens combines elements of the Romantic era with what we call the Victorian era, which is not only the emotionality of, of these authors, but also of observing the world and all of its true complicated facets. So social issues, political problems, man interaction with man. These are things that now the Victorian era picks up. So there's a, there goes from the heavy, heavy emotionality to a hint of, not a hint, but a fair amount of realism. We still don't call it realist literature, but it's now that, that emotion is infused with a realistic depiction of societies. So that's where we pick up with a guy like Charles Dickens. And how we get a book like The Tale of Two Cities. Joseph Conrad, who's an author in the 20th century, when he looked back on the novel, because we, we might think, well, we have this book and we wonder what exactly it is. And Conrad, looking back, says, this is what a novel should do. What is a novel, if not a conviction, of our fellow men's existence strong enough to take upon itself a form of imagined life clearer than reality and whose accumulated verisimilitude, means truthfulness, of selected episodes puts to shame the pride of documentary history? Meaning... Maybe we can learn more about the world we live in than just the facts we read from a history book or from a science text. That there's actually truths out there that can be depicted in a fictional form that actually are clearer and easier to understand and maybe even more truthful than just telling the facts of history. So when we look at Dickens in this historical novel, we wonder if he's successful or not.
I'm not usually huge on author biographies because um, we as critics don't put a lot of stock in connecting people's real lives to their fictional lives, uh, the fictional creations. So um, I don't usually go into this too heavily, but I'm just going to give you a couple things to think about because in Dickens' case, you can totally see what, what comes out in his fictional works. So Dickens was born in a large family and lived in a, a relatively normal childhood in England until he was about 12. At that time, his father was arrested and sent to prison because he owed money to people. So that's not something that occurs anymore where if, you, if I owe you money, I can get sent to jail. Um, but that occurred back in England at that time. When his father was sent to jail, his mother and his younger siblings also went to prison with him. Sort of an odd thing to think about where your whole family ends up going to jail. Charles was one of the only ones who didn't go and because he was old enough to start actually working. So in, he's pulled out of school and he's sent to live with a family friend while his mom and dad and sisters and brothers are sent to prison. And at the age of 12, he is sent to work and he works uh, at a boot blacking factory, which is like shoe polish. And he works 10 hour days. And so we see what the, uh, the economic conditions uh, relating to factory work and child labor, um, those are talked a lot in, uh, about in various fictional works. People, uh, lots of authors discuss those. Well, Dickens actually lived through it. He did it. So right from an early age, we can see where some of his key themes emerge in his books. He talks a lot in his books about prison talks a lot about poverty. He talks a lot about child, child uh, labor and children trying to deal with the mess that adults have made of the world. So these are things that pop up in almost all of his novels especially. Eventually his father does get out of prison. He's able to, he, he inherits a tiny bit of money so he pays off his debts. And uh, at that time he's able to go back to school for a little while longer. But at age 15 he starts working. And he uh, works at a law office at the age of 15, and the legal system also becomes a key component in all of, not all, but many of his books, if you read his other works. Um, and by the age of 20, he becomes a journalist. So he, he starts focusing his whole life on writing. He tends to write for uh, legal and political newspapers, and he writes, uh, he comments on stories and court cases and events of the day um, uh, as a journalist. But in between his writing assignments, he starts his creative writing. He starts writing short stories, that some of which eventually become chapters in novels. So by the age of 20, he's off and running with what is going to make him super famous. By the time he gets to Tale of Two Cities, he's, he's already quite successful. But Tale of Two Cities is uh, written in 30 one weekly installments. So, a boom in literacy started, eh, it had been ongoing, but it really picked up right before, let's say, the American Revolution. So, you know, the, in the 1700s, people start becoming much more literate. It's not just for the clergy, not just for rich people. Many Regular folks, common citizens, start having a little bit more access to education, which means there's more uh, literacy um, in those nations. And so with an increase in literacy, there becomes an increase for people to produce more. Right? Now people can actually read my stuff. I can get published. So we have these magazines and newspapers that publish entire books week by week. It becomes a serialization. What this serializing does is it actually, one, it allows people to have something to read every single week, which is nice, but it also created a way for the audience to interact with the author, which doesn't usually happen when an author secludes himself and writes a whole book and publishes it and you don't hear anything from him for three years. The author can hear on the streets what people think of how his book is going. And that influences what the author might write, because then the next week the author might hear, oh, the, the public seems to really like this character. Let's expand that person's role a little bit more in this story. This person really hates this character. Let's get rid of him, or let's take his plot and you know, 
have it disappear, which actually happens in several of his books. It's kind of frustrating that uh, you'll be reading about a, a certain character and halfway through the book he'll disappear. Well, chances are he got feedback that no one liked that character. Get rid of him. And so the author actually adjusts to the audience. So when we have weekly installments, it's much like television shows that we have today or that we've had in the past. You're only getting a piece every week. The public can react to it. The creators adjust to what the public likes. And it's a very, um, it's just an interesting way of publishing work that's very different from publishing an entire work one at a time. So what also happens with these serialized novels is because you're, you're paid, you're contracted based on how many installments you're gonna, you're gonna do. So as we said, Tale of Two Cities is done over 31 weeks. Some were longer. And so what we end up getting from Dickens and these other successful writers of the time period is, in some cases, these massive books. Tale of Two Cities is actually, I think, his second shortest book. You might think it's long. It's super tiny compared to his other books. He has a couple that are eight, 900 pages. Well, why? Because he's got to fill up like 50 weeks of, of newspapers, right? So he has these massive stories with tons and tons of characters. One of his novels has 45 named important characters. 45, and that doesn't even include the people who don't even have names. So Dickens is just one of the authors who takes advantage of this serialization process to create these gigantic works of, of, uh, of literature, these novels. What we also see is, as these books have the size to, to sustain it, we see the deeper connections into the social issues. So the author can draw out these social problems um, such as poverty or injustice or whatever the author's talking about in many installments over a very long period of time and affecting many different characters all at the same time. So the, the, the way in which these books are published dramatically influences what actually shows up in the books. What we also see when things are serialized is the author has to create cliffhangers. There has to be a stopping point because you know, well, I can't just keep writing. I've got to figure out a way to stop so that the audience picks it back up next week and wants to keep reading. And so if you notice, through many of the chapters, a lot of them end on an interesting piece of information, and then that's the end of the chapter. Or something just happens, and you get a break. So a couple examples of that. Um, you know, the first installment ends right after chapter 3, after Manette is released from prison. So we have this beginning where he's in prison. They break him out, and that's the break. All right? And then we're left to wonder, well, how, why was he in there in the first place? What's going to happen next? Well, that'll happen next week. Tale of Two Cities also has a pretty amazing structure because it fits perfectly for what a story should do, actually. At the end of Act Two, the book, the second, right, we have the, the character with the biggest secret going into the most dangerous place, which is exactly what should happen at the end of, paragraph two, uh, uh, of Act Two of any book or of any movie. It's that mark in the film or in the book where, okay, you're in it now. You can't get out of it. You're going to have to face the worst. And that's usually what pushes you to the end. So the structure of Tale of Two Cities is, is if, you, if you understand the structure, it's very helpful for understanding how it was put together and why it is such an effective book. Uh, I've also included, the, if you want to click this link when I post this PowerPoint, you can actually see through this link the weekly installment. So you can actually check for yourself where the breaks are in your own text uh, and see how they had so many cliffhangers that kept people reading. So Mark, uh, Dickens becomes super successful. He, he, he uh, satisfies his readers for many, many years. He becomes quite wealthy from it. Um, and when you participate in a, a market like serialization of, of, of books or newspaper or magazine publication, you have, to, you have to embrace the capitalistic process, which is what Dickens ends up doing. Sort of interesting, though, because many people think, oh, Dickens is the, the voice for being hostile to capitalism, that he's the key literary figure for criticizing these class hierarchies for social injustice, um, you know, commenting on poverty and things that are unfair, that he's the most important writer. And in a way, that is true. Um, 
which led Karl Marx, who had read a lot of Charles Dickens by, by this time, he, read, he said that uh, Dickens issued to the world more political and social truths than have ever been uttered by all the professional politicians, publicists, and moralists put together. So, a guy like Karl Marx ends up liking your work, you must think, well, well he's really anti-capitalism. But he's actually not. Dickens, throughout his books, though he does obviously address those things we've been talking about, he does discuss store owners who are doing the right thing. That owning something, that being an entrepreneur, that having ownership of property is very important and valuable for, for maintaining our social structures. He, in many of his books, has descriptions of products being available in London or elsewhere that wouldn't normally be available except for the capitalistic process, such as you know, walking through a market and having fruits and vegetables available in England in wintertime. Yeah, that doesn't occur without capitalism. He also discusses how some characters really make bad economic decisions, and they're punished for it, which they should be in capitalism. So it's, it's a little bit unfair to say uh, Dickens is the leading figure for um, kind of the proletariat voice or for uh, social injustice or that he's the biggest defender of poverty and, and he hates capitalism. That's not exactly um, completely accurate. Dickens was probably like a lot of people during this time period. He saw the benefits of capitalism, the emergence of industrialism, that there's more products, there's more things, we get wealthier. Those are good things. He embraced that while also recognizing that, yeah, there are some problematic components to it as well, and that's what he writes about. So he's, he's sort of stuck in the middle like most people are. Here's what Paul Cantor, who's a, another English scholar, in his book, uh, Literature and the Economics of Liberty, which was a very, very important book for me in my own research. This is what uh, he says about Charles Dickens and his success in the marketplace as an author. Um, Dickens once gave a speech where he, he was really thankful for the, um, the emerging middle class, that people had saved enough money that they were working hard enough to have extra money that they could buy his literature and buy other people's art. Um, you know, he, he viewed that as being very valuable, valuable. But Cantor writes, some might cynically observe that Dickens had every reason to speak well of a middle class public that made him rich and famous. But that's just the point. The Victorian audience he's writing for had the good taste to single out Dickens as the greatest literary genius in its midst, thus effectively refuting the myth that a true artist is always misunderstood by his contemporaries and rejected by the marketplace. Uh, under Dickens' leadership, a journal he edited called Household Words was a staunch advocate of free trade, defending capitalism in mid-Victorian England. Dickens himself was an accomplished entrepreneur. When he grew dissatisfied with the conditions under which he was being forced to publish, nothing stopped him from setting up as a publisher himself, and he became very wealthy in the process. He understood that the rapid development of commercial publishing had a liberating effect on its authors, freeing them from their centuries-old dependence on patrons and giving them more direct access to a newly created mass audience. This is only due to capitalism. All Dickens wanted was a chance to prove himself as an author in the marketplace. And when he had the opportunity, he clearly made the most of it. Along with Shakespeare, Dickens stands as the most convincing proof that commercial and artistic success in literature are not inc incompatible. So the old Lying that, oh, well, no one understands me. I'm the tortured artist. I'm going to be poor and struggling my whole life. No, if you do it right, you actually can be successful. So those of you who are artists and writers and musicians and whatever else you want to be, creators of any kind, participating in the marketplace, it can work. You have to be good, but it works. So based on the fact that, Marx, uh, that uh, Dickens ends up becoming pretty much the wealthiest author in all of England, <laughs> Maybe the joke was on Marx. He's not uh, the person Marx thought he was. A few literary techniques to think about as we get close to finishing up here. 
These aren't to be memorized. So I'm just going to give you a list here. And if you don't remember them, that's fine. And you don't need to write them down uh, unless you truly want to. But what these literary techniques are for is to demonstrate to us how an author creates an atmosphere in his work. That it goes beyond just telling you the facts. Because we don't really respond to facts. We respond to the creativity of story. And to do that, you have to go beyond just basic language, basic facts. There has to be some other techniques involved. And so let me show you just a few of the more obvious examples of these. So as you're reading, you can get more comfortable identifying them yourself. All right. So a key one. Uh, the idea of an extended metaphor, super simple. Uh, a comparison that, that exists throughout a, a whole work. It's not just a metaphor that exists in one scene or, or for one person or anything like that. It, it, it goes throughout the whole text. Well, Lucy is a pretty good example of a metaphor that extends throughout the whole book. Right? She's actually referred to as the golden thread. Okay? And if you, uh, what's interesting to try to do is notice how many times Lucy is referred to, and every time she's discussed or described in the text, how often the word light or the word shine shows up, or even the word gold. But light and shine show up every single time. Obviously, Dickens is trying to tell us something, right? So she's golden in that she's this innocent, beautiful person. She's the light that kind of contrasts with all the darkness going on. But she's also the thread that ties all of these characters together. She's related to Manette, that's her father. She has various people in love with her. People take action for her. She's the one that connects all the people. If you actually look up, uh, if you Google the word light in Latin or shine in Latin, you'll see how closely those words end up being like the word Lucy. So look for things that exist throughout a whole text. They can tie everything together. Basic symbolism. Now, most of these are various forms of symbolism, but, um, you know, Madame Defarge, Knitting is a, is a form of symbolism, right? What does it symbolize? Well, it symbolizes the keeping track of names that eventually she wants to kill. So her, uh, her knitting work becomes a symbol for the impending death of various characters. The idea of foreshadowing, giving a hint of what's going to come later. Foreshadowing occurs in so many of these chapters because, as we said, they're broken down on, that way on purpose, like they were the weekly installments. So in order to give a hint of what's to come in the future weeks, there's tons of foreshadowing that goes on throughout this whole book. A key one is the word blood that's written on the wall. This is when the wine spills in uh, book one, chapter five. We also see the idea of imagery. And in this book, it's interesting because Dickens is actually writing a bit past what we might call the Gothic part of Romanticism, and yet he uses it in many, uh, in many examples. Um, let me just show you a quick couple so you know what I mean by Gothic imagery. Remember that these authors are trying to elicit emotion out of people, right? And what Gothic writers did was use scary things, dark things, because fear is one of the easiest emotions to elicit from people. So when an author does that, and the, the descriptions they give are probably aiming towards this Gothic style of writing. So um, in book one, chapter two, we see sentences like this. There was a steaming mist in all the hollows, and it had roamed in its forlornness up the hill like an evil spirit, seeking rest and finding none. A clammy and intensely cold mist it made its slow way through the air in ripples that visibly followed and overspread one another as the waves of an unwholesome sea might do. It was dense enough to shut out everything from the light of the coach lamps, but these its own workings in a few yards of road, and the reek of the laboring horses steamed into it as if they had made it all. Later on, we hear a description. It's even even more traditional Gothic. The great, uh, this is in uh, book nine, or sorry, book two, chapter nine. The great door clanged behind him, and Monsieur the Marquis crossed a hall grim with certain old boar spears, swords, and knives of the chase, grimmer with certain heavy riding rods and riding whips, 
of which many a peasant, gone to his benefactor death, had felt the weight when his lord was angry. So you get these descriptions of these dark castles, these dingy, wet swamps, their shadows. Uh, it's scary. It's eerie. That's Gothic imagery. So you can think back to various stories you've heard uh, from authors who use a lot of that type of imagery. Dickens doesn't usually do that in his books. As I said, he's kind of past that era where that was pretty common. But he uses it to great effect here because he's talking about prisons and you know, escapes and you know, trying to get us to be as fearful for its char his characters as he can. Synecdoche is sort of a funny word, but it's where you have one thing representing a whole. So in the chapters uh, in book two, seven and eight, the idea of Monsignor. Monsignor is a little confusing because he's an actual person, but he also represents an entire class of people. He's, he's the stand-in for the rich nobles, let's say. All right? So if you can kind of figure out that, oh, he's not, he's, he is talking about a person, but he's also talking about a whole group of people you'll understand what Dickens is, is doing. And that's, the, that's what the fancy word synecdoche, uh, synecdoche actually refers to. Use of irony. It's where your expectations are subverted. He goes the other way where you think things are going one direction. So a quick example in book two, chapter four, where uh, Darnay and Carton are, are chatting and he actually had just rescued him with his clever uh, manipulation in the courtroom. Um, Carton says to Darnay, Indeed, I begin to think we are not much alike in any particular, you and I. Well, as we come to know, the entire plot is based on them being very much alike, right? So, uh, little bits of irony throughout. Also, uh, sarcasm. Dickens doesn't use as much of this in this book as he does in other books. But he does employ it now and again. So uh, when he refers to the guillotine as the national razor or as a barber, that's pretty, pretty dark humor, pretty dark sarcasm, right? It's not, it's not just a trim people are going in for. Um, what was my other example here? Oh, book one, chapter one. Same thing at the very beginning of the book. We see a little bit of this dark humor emerge right in the very first chapter. He says, France, less favored on the whole as to matters spiritual than her sister of the shield and trident, rolled with exceeding smoothness downhill, making paper money and spending it. Under the guidance of her Christian pastors, she entertained herself, besides, with such humane achievements as sentencing a youth to have his hands cut off, his tongue torn out with pincers, and his body burned alive, because he had not kneeled down in the rain to do honor to a dirty procession of monks which passed within his view. So again, saying... Okay, here's how great things are. They're doing these humane things like cutting off people's hands. So, very dark humor that uh, Dickens employs in various spots. And then lastly, this odd word called anaphora. It's a repetition of a word or phrase, and you've heard it a million times before. You hear it in Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, where you begin each section with, I have a dream that one day, I have a dream, I have a dream. We hear it in Churchill, we shall fight, we shall fight, we shall fight. He keeps repeating himself. We see it in um, Book 1, Chapter 5, the chapter that has the most uh, of these literary elements in it, where he refers to hunger over and over and over. Hunger was pushed out of the tall houses. Hunger was patched into them. Hunger stared down from the smokeless chimneys. A whole paragraph with hunger, hunger, hunger. He's trying to drive home a point, obviously, right? The most famous example is the phrase of the, the phrasing, it was, it was this, it was, that we see in the very first passage of the book. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received, for good or for evil, in the superlative degree of comparison only. It was. It was. So the repetition sticks out in our mind. We actually remember this passage perhaps more than any other passage in this book. Maybe the most famous opening lines of any piece of literature ever. 
What this opening paragraph also does for us, and this is where we'll, we'll wrap up today, is it also hints toward why Dickens is writing this book. He's not just writing a story about the French Revolution. We have to understand that. He's writing a story about the French Revolution as a way of comparing how Britain is for him in the present. Things he's seeing in the present, he says, are very similar to what used to be going on in the events that preceded the French Revolution. So he's, he's writing this as a warning. And so often what he says there towards the end of the passage, you know, we often think, oh, well, things that are going on are over there. They're nothing like what's going on over here. We often draw these really black and white distinctions, and we say, oh, that could never happen here. He's saying, no, no, no. There's a reason I'm comparing these things, that it's so much like the present time. It's a warning to say, be careful if we allow our country of England to go the way of France, these are the things that could happen as well. That's what most of that first chapter is about. What I think is also something to think about is by presenting these perceived opposites, that things can be great, but things can also go horribly wrong. This is my own interpretation of the passage, but I think he's setting up for us an analysis of how tenuous that line could actually be. That it actually doesn't take a lot to go from thinking things are great to now thinking things are the absolute worst. It's, we're not as far apart as we think we are. We're actually pretty close to the middle where we always have the power to make things go either way, and it's up to us to decide how that actually goes. And it's up in this book to see how those characters make things either go towards the best of times or towards the worst of times. Something, something to think about here. An image that's reflected towards the end, I'll start to mention now, and that's the idea that some people set out to create a form of heaven. Right? We're all going direct to heaven. Some people set out to create in their social world, some version of hell. We know that happens. But maybe worst of all, there's also a group of people who think they're trying to create a version of heaven, but end up creating a version of hell. And they may not even realize it until it's too late. So I think where this book starts in this opening passage that's so memorable is that I think he's outlining the ideas that be careful of thinking that things are so distinct from each other. Things are a lot more similar than we would like to think. And in fact, we can go either direction at any point. It's up to us to figure out where we're going to go. And as we continue reading for this, uh, the rest of this book for Thursday, we're going to see the choices that these characters make and how they create versions of heaven and hell in the story. <laughs>